Hello. This is a review or look back to a presentation that I gave about a year and a half ago at uh, Luca in Italy. And it was a big deal for me to put these thoughts together. Um, and I've found it, you know, it was foundational to the work that I was doing at the time on Champions Now. And it's also relevant to my other superhero design work right now, which includes Cosmic Zap and Vigil. And I think it will be uh, really, really interesting to people who are addressing some of these games or playing many of the other superhero role-playing games, which have you know, proliferated so much in the last decade. So, as you can see, it is called The Death of the Superhero. And the basic idea is, you know, what is this thing? People even asked me recently, what do you think is the fantasy of the superhero? And I realized that this really needed to be, you know, said. All right. My first point is historical. And I'm looking at the comics companies in the United States that most people think of first, um, which are Marvel, which at the time was merely an imprint, um, and DC, again, not a company name, but a, a subset among you know many other things. Well, anyway, in 1968, there was a kind of remarkable moment, um, very discontinuous moment in American comics mm -hmm. history. Um, here we have the purchase of Goodman Publications by something at the time called the Perfect Film and Chemical Corporation in New Jersey, uh, soon renamed Cadence Industries. Now, the groundwork for the content of those comics, as we know, uh, was laid by Stan Lee, Jack Kirby, and Steve Ditko, and others, um, I particularly want to focus on one of the first major hires during the period just before the purchase, specifically Roy Thomas, pictured here at that time, um, and his uh, subsequent, after the purchase, subsequent hiring and cultivation of many very ambitious writers. So that would be all the people that you see listed here, among others. Now, with this in mind, um, bear in mind that Perfect Film and Chemical Corporation had, shall we say, minimum interest in the content of the comics themselves. And so, therefore, Thomas had an amazing amount of freedom and power, both for hiring and for editorial policies. He was extremely ambitious. He was a big comics fan, but more importantly, also had a background in uh, English teaching and um, just a general literary approach to everything. Okay, so we have that happening simultaneously in a very different corporate circumstance. Uh, National Allied Publications, which included National Comics, which is the real name of the company that we're talking about, or, or the division or activity, not really a company. Anyway, through a whole series of things involving such properties as Playboy, Family Circle, parking garages, and a movie company, uh, Warner Communications, uh, excuse me, Warner Brothers, um, they all were being pulled together in a huge merger whose roots go all the way back to, you know, mob activity back in the 20s and is fascinating. But the point is it's a much bigger entity. Uh, it's creating one of the first major conglomerates, um, took place through a series of years and was, can kind of be dated at the ink is dry in 1968. And so what we think of as DC Comics, which wasn't even named that until many years later after this, um, basically underwent an incredible shakeup. It no longer having now in much more, you know, public ownership and being, uh, under a great deal more scrutiny, under corporate structure and many things, a lot of its practices had to change. Also, most of the people who were active in it until this point were aging out. Harry Donenfeld had died in 1965, um, for example, um, and most of the famous editors, such as Mort Weisinger, were really, really past the point, by their own admission, where they could even tolerate doing this anymore. 
So, strangely enough, the editor-in-chief for this activity, as organized or negotiated in some way, was Carmine Infantino. Carmine Infantino was an artist, a long-standing comics artist. Now, any of you who know comics history know that the notion of taking one of these artists and making them an editor-in-chief is like, the, the, it's unheard of. You don't do that. Um, Infantino lost no time in cultivating uh, the same thing. In fact, the, the company had begun doing that a little bit already, um, and an enormous number of people, both new and old, um, were were gathered by Infantino, um, arguably in kind of a let's go Marvel sort of way. Um, some of these names are, you know, all of these names are basically legendary, um, and they also worked for other comic book companies, including Marvel too. Kirby and Ditko are particularly important because they, at this time, decided that they would rather be working for Carmine Infantino, where he promised them a great deal of creative control. So that's a big deal in that shift, and everybody else in there is a big deal along these lines too. Well, anyway, uh, so this begins, and also, so Infantino really has no... No one's breathing over his shoulder. They're or over. They're, they're into his ear. They are concerned about sales, but they're not concerned about content particularly. Um, and so, both of these editors in chief, um, I should clarify in retrospect as well. Uh, after 1968, you really just shouldn't think of Stan Lee as you know running or guiding or whatevering Marvel from that point forward. Um, it, it's really Thomas's place. To, to run for a few years, you know, particularly after 1970 or so. So if before you start thinking, you know, Stan Lee, Marvel, it's, he's kind of out of the picture. So anyway, um, both of these people have extraordinary power. or and, and each of them practiced a great deal of benign neglect in terms of letting writers do what they want. Um, so this, this is just nuts. So then if we move to, you know, how brief this was, um, both companies, again, at their different scales, operated significantly differently after, you know, the mid-70s. Um, DC Comics got its name in 1977. Um, that's all part of a huge restructuring um, that some of you will remember as being called the DC Explosion. And the role as the uh, in the editor-chief, again, you know, not reaching him sensibly in this, this sense, not reaching into the creative community, but bringing in um, a very competent manager uh, of Jeanette Kahn. Jim Shooter is a slightly different and interesting example. Um, also being brought in at this time, uh, Cadence shifts from not caring a bit about what's in the comics to start thinking much more in terms of licensing, toys, movies, and stuff like that. The TV programs, of course, come to mind. And um, the, the effectively, the, the chaos at, at Marvel, because the editorships had broken down and been you know, traded around among a variety of people, um, is resolved by instating a, an editor-in-chief with very different and managerial tasks. And they bring in who is effectively an outsider, the very young Jim Shooter, who had been writing comics for, you know, years before as a very young person, um, had dropped out of doing it and was kind of rediscovered and brought in saying, effectively, can you make some sense out of this madness and let's get some toys made? So... Anyway, that's going on, um, and I will also say that events after that, uh, which I think pretty much define fandom, and me saying this excommunicates me instantly, but I call it the curse of verse. Um, but in both companies, consolidating their uh, their content and saying, "All right, we now have effectively we've we world built, so now we're going to work with this world that we've built." And so you can see, you know, all of these these publications and, and situations are part of that, managed by extremely rabid, if charming, and committed fans 
now made prominent editors, um, Paul Levitz at DC and Mark Grunewald at Marvel. Um, so let's also look at how for both companies, uh, the relationship of how they their content goes into larger media matters a lot. Um, during the period that I'm talking about, the, the, it, it was kind of a mess um, and not very successful um, with, with a couple of breakouts. Superman 1978 um, is one of them. But really, it didn't click for that body of companies and concerns until Batman in 1989 with a surprise in the form of the animated series for Batman. But the deal is, at this point, we are seeing, like it or not, the material in the comics becoming supportive and promotional for these much bigger ticket entities. This had always been the case for the National Comics Stable, going all the way back to the newspaper strips and radio shows of the very late 30s. And this this weird period I'm talking about is kind of a period where, for some reason, the writers and artists just weren't caring about what was going to happen in the movie or in the TV show or whatever. The comics were not, were sort of off the leash from that. Um, and so here, for those characters, the leash is kind of restored. And in the Marvel zone, it was very different. Instead of being embedded in that scene from the beginning, it was chasing the dragon the whole time, you know, scrabbling after whatever deals it could make. And um, the person who needs to be sort of given credit for getting traction in this is Avi Arad, um, who was involved with the animated series for the X-Men, and then the big breakout, unexpected by everybody, um, which is a blade in 1988 but the other important point is that unlike the national slash dc circumstance marvel as an entire entity shifted ownership drastically multiple times it's instead of being sort of just Im embedded in bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger layers you know like the dc or, sorry the, the warner aol merger and then time anyway you can see what i mean it just sort of gets bigger more and more and more and more layers you know grow and conglomerate with these comics being just a teeny piece already in there marvel's very different it's more like a hot potato it, it just keeps being tossed from weirder and different owners to weirder and different owners um, and you can see it's sort of apotheosis in this regard to even approach anything that the DC characters already were doesn't happen until the Disney purchase. Okay, so now that you've kind of got this, this historical view and say, wow, that period, 68 through about 78, you know, with trails and pieces up into the early 80s, this, this is weird. The comics are not structurally in the same place. Now let's take a look at a role-playing game uh, that is right in the middle of that period, right? It expresses that period uh, beautifully. This could apply to um, this could apply to any number of the role-playing games of that time. Villains and Vigilantes definitely gets pride of place in this discussion as well. But I want to talk about Champions 3rd Edition. Um, it's, it's a piece of what I call first generations champions. Um, and I want to emphasize that the hero system did not exist. The hero system was not published until years later. And the fourth edition of champions is the first version that was embedded in that house system. Until that point, the different hero games publications were very distinctive as games. And um, there's lots of interesting artifacts of any interactions among them that we could talk about. But I really want to say that this game died. That it, its practices, its principles um, effectively were flensed from memory. And it's very hard today even to get people to understand that we are not talking about the hero system. Um, well, anyway, so I want to... Ah, there we go. I even have a diagram about that. Right, so this is sort of a brief look, um, probably not... Oh, 
current version of this graphic that I won't bore you with too much except to say that the first generations, I think, hit a stopping point, that the hero system, which included particularly the Champions 4th and 5th editions, are more influenced by these other things, hero games like Danger International, and um, the uh, and, and then GURPS as a developing system as well. Those actually are what flowed into that form of Champions. Modern version of Champions include uh, one in particular, and now two. One of them was the what's called 6th edition by Steve Long, which I consider to be a very personal take on the uh, on the existing hero system champions by Steve. And so rather than being an extension, you know, champions 4th, 5th, 6th as a developing trajectory, it's kind of a bounce off of it into, you know, at a different angle. And um, I've done the same thing with champions now. I've taken that first generation champions and said, all right, I'm going to bounce off of that at my angle, whatever it may be. Kind of wish that was a three-dimensional graphic so you can see that our, our angles are actually different. But anyway, so that's what I did with Champions Now, was to go back to that game.